Uh, hello to everybody, dear friends, dear colleagues, and dear cinematography enthusiasts. Today we have a new episode of Imago Talks, and the first made by the Imago Masterclass Committee. Imago Talks is a space to speak about issues that concern cinematography from many points of view, conceptual, artistic, technical, and uh, every every concert, every subject on the cinematography. But today we are talking about copyright and the role of the director of photography plays in the industry. Every two months, we will have renowned cinematographers here sharing their knowledge and discussing issues that per pertain to our trade. Today we are joined other than our special guest, Lars Peterson from Sweden Association as moderator, and Carlos Congote from the Colombian Association as translator of Miguel Moedo sometimes because he is starting speaking in English. I want to thank the entire Imago administrative team for their support to organize this event, especially Marcela Borso and Alex Linden and Mustafa Barat, our president. So I welcome you to this talk, which uh, I'm sure will be of great interest to you. And now I give the floor to Lars. Yes, Lars here. Uh, so this is our second episode. And uh, uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Yes. yes, I can be heard, great. Uh, so we're uh, uh, joined here uh, this evening, or depending what where you are on the globe, I guess, but if, you, if you're in uh, Europe, it's evening here. And we're joined here by uh, several distinguished colleagues here. We have Adriano Goldman, AAC, BEC, ABC, and Miguel Amuedo, AEC, and also Carlos Congot, uh, ADFC. There has been a flyer sent out obviously here with, with the presentations of the participants. And uh, I thought I'd just say uh, a few words to introduce um, our special speakers here, Miguel Amuedo and uh, Adriana Goldman. So um, uh, this is sort of uh, what's uh, on the flyer as well. So Miguel Amuedo is, uh, born in Seville, and he's a Spanish cinematographer with over 20 years of experience in film and television. And uh, he's known for his distinctive visual style, especially expressive use of color. And he has been responsible to, uh, for contributing to, uh, to uh, uh, great international recognition for Spanish productions, uh, various Spanish TV series such as Casa de Papel, Sky Rojo, Vis a Vis, Ministerio del Tiempo. Uh, uh, especially interesting for this evening for our discussion, um, facet of uh, Miguel's work is that he, uh, uh, on series that he's been working on, he has uh, uh, taken on a role as more of a, uh, a supervising his roles. So this is something we want to, to um, talk about as well. So a few words uh, about Adriano also, Adriano Goldman. And uh, um, Adriano Goldman is a Brazilian cinematographer, but uh, active all over the globe. And uh, has, uh, uh, has had a lot of success with the Netflix series, The Crown, for which he has won two Emmys, a BAFTA, and two AC awards. So I think Adriana Goldman is probably uh, quite familiar to, to most of our viewers and listeners uh, already. So, and uh, uh, a few words about Carlos, perhaps, Carlos Mangote, uh, born in Colombia. And uh, Carlos, I guess you, you are in Colombia now, right? Yes, I live yes. in Colombia, in Bogota. Yes, so so this is like uh, uh, eleven noon for you. 
yeah middle of the day uh yes it's middle of the day it's 11 o'clock in the morning in colombia okay 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 good so uh you had the great honor of working with ed, ed lackman a lot yes i did mm -hmm. yeah i was very very young yeah uh, 24 years old and he came to colombia to uh do a feature film and i was a second assistant cameraman okay that's a, a charming gentleman to to learn the trade from and i had the honor of meeting Miguel about 15 years ago when he came to colombia to do a TV series. Okay, yes, it's true. <laughs> All right, so so you guys know each other. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and uh, you have worked as uh, um, a DOP on feature films and directed many TV spots also. Yes. And you are also active in education. Yes, very much. We opened up a film school in Colombia. Okay, good. And you'll be helping us out. Uh, the, the strategy is to sort of do this in English and uh, whenever somebody feels uh, more. I think we're Spanish, losing. Just do it that way. We're losing you sporadically, Lars. Uh, maybe me? Internet, yeah, maybe your internet is not as good. Um, I hope it is. Miguel, Miguel uh, is gonna speak English, so. Uh, right. I might not even come in, but if there is any need for translation, I'll be happy to. Right. Thank you, Carlos, for having me. <laughs> we feel like I just weigh in. Okay. So the uh, the subject for this evening is the new role of uh, the new role of the director of photography. And uh, so. Um, we thought it could be prudent to to start out by by talking a little bit about what the uh, traditional responsibilities of a director of photography is uh and uh, of course there are many colleagues here who, who know this know this backwards but uh, there may also be uh, uh younger listeners and and in the audience here for whom it could be uh interesting and also this would lead us on to uh, because we wanted to talk uh, a little about copyright and remuneration uh, issues and, and uh, residuals and that sort of thing. And there's a connection here to the traditional role uh, on, say, a feature film, where you would expect to be remunerated um, for reruns and, and other platforms where uh, a film is shown. And... Uh, uh, and then also as opposed to how this would work on a, a series. So yeah, we have a slide here. We could, could we have the slide, Dimi? So the traditional responsibilities of a director of photography, say on a feature film, that would entail being hired uh, a certain amount of time in advance and having certain responsibilities. And this, okay, so, uh, uh, Miki Adriano, would you uh, would you want to say a few words just about the uh, traditional responsibilities of an ODP hired in advance and uh, and uh, fields that you would be uh, supervising? Miki, please start you. Okay, <laughs> I, 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 I'm happy to start. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. This is a great honor and a great opportunity to be able to be talking to now 108 uh, people it's amazing it's just a shame we cannot see them all I mean, it would be amazing to be able to um, i know the vast majority of uh, the audience probably is familiar with uh, what we do as director of photography i um i but i still kind of a, almost like on a daily basis uh, have to answer that, that that question i mean what do you do i mean what is your actual job um, so the usual questions are, so you deal with lenses or, oh, you, you're behind the camera or you deal with lights or, so there's a, I think there's a confusion about exactly what we do. I, my father was an architect and I kind of use this usually as an example that the script, either for a feature film or for a series, it doesn't matter. It's just a, a document, it's a project for something like in architecture, you have the drawings but you cannot call the drawings architecture. I mean, it's only architecture once it's built. 
So I think in, in, in the filmmaking, I'd say it's more or less the same. The, the script is a document and I'd say that the director of photography and the production designer are the director's main collaborations to help him to turn something that is on paper into a visual uh, art, into a visual expression. So uh, the, the production designer would probably deal more with sets and colors and uh, choosing locations and even, even like bridging with the costume department and eventually the makeup department. And the DOP, the director of photography, would deal with, again, also visiting locations and uh, trying to read the script, break down the script into scenes, into shots, into a shot list eventually. Uh, all the choices in terms of like how to frame, uh, how to light, what is the density, what's the color scheme for a, for, the, for the specific show, a specific story. So I think all those creative conversations happen during prep. Uh, uh, of course, at, at the very same time, both production designers and the GOP run a, a, a technical department. So there's a lot of management on what we do as well. And I'd say that in order to start the conversation, I, I can say probably because be, I've been lucky, I don't actually feel uh, that my role has changed much. I think there's, a, there's now, of course, you do feature films, it's a different sort of game. If you do series, it's a, it's a different way of working with your directors and the showrunner, something that doesn't exist on the feature film side. So there's a little bit more, but that's also, I, I'd say this has been the story behind this medium that feature films are more a director's art and series have been always more in the hands of producers. I mean, all over history. So I, I, don't, I don't think that, I don't, I don't feel myself less powerful these days. I mean, maybe because, you know, of course I've been involved on a show that is big and give good conditions to work uh, with creative people, with a showrunner that doesn't interfere much on the actual uh, filmmaking. I mean, of, you know, specific filmmaking, shooting. I mean, he does, he gets very much involved on the writing and the editing, but not so much on the actual making of your footage and, uh, and, 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 the, and, the, and the tricky choices that you have to face during prep and also when you're shooting. Uh, I know there is an issue now because I mean, it really depends if you like, Miguel is probably gonna agree with me. If you're the lead DOP on a series, you've got actually a good amount of power. If you're not the lead DOP, if you're just a guest DOP that comes for like a couple episodes, let's say, you get less power because you have to somehow follow someone else's visual Bible that's that's the case in the majority of the of the series we we do and work on now um but i'd say well those are the traditional responsibilities and of course your role and your power can vary depending on the show you're doing or depending on who's the director and the producers you're having to deal with but i uh i know that mig is going to really present something that is quite new even for me is new and i think it's really appreciated. I think it's a massive step in our careers to be able to, con to have more control, to have more participation on the creative decisions and even uh, the chance to get, in to get some residuals at the end. So I think that's my initial uh, uh, yeah, words. Yeah. Uh, Adriano, could I just uh, ask you there, what, what uh, would you feel would be a a comfortable uh, prep time on a feature as uh, well Lars, if you just a uh, higher deal on the series yes I, I i i'd say it depends i mean it really depends on the budget and the size of the whole thing i'd say that nowadays if you if you if you're shooting a feature film and you have going to have 10 shooting weeks they probably give you six maybe seven prep weeks uh, on big series like The Crown, for instance, and the other Star Wars series I did just recently in between seasons on The Crown, uh, if you're the lead DOP, you get a long prep, something like 10, maybe sometimes 12 weeks. 
So that's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting approach to, and I, I think that also shows how the market appreciates that the GOPs start early and prep as well as they can to make the actual machine, you know, work from the, from the very beginning. But I think that can vary a lot. It really depends on the size and budget of, I mean, both feature films and, and series can vary a lot in terms of, you know, the power you have. It's also very much dependent on the money you're dealing with, you're, the money you're managing or as, as, as a head of department. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, uh, Miga, you are in sort of a unique position in that uh, you uh, uh, work as a visual designer on a series, uh, on a Netflix series. Uh, could you uh, could you explain to us what what that sort of uh, what are the uh, the added responsibilities of a visual designer on a series? Okay, I I think that I'm going to to um, to change to Spanish for this question. Sorry, and. Um, bueno, habría, habría que contar que, que digamos que el contexto de, de las series ha cambiado muy rápidamente en los últimos años. Please, Carlos. Yes, the context of the TV series has changed quite a lot in the latest uh, few years. Y que actualmente las series de televisión se han convertido en un fenómeno cultural de nuestro tiempo, ¿no? Creo que son la forma más importante de, de, de arte popular, de... de Del momento, ¿no? And now TV series have become a very popular phenomenon of uh, popular art and uh, for all of us. Y, y con la expansión de la plataforma de streaming y, y la reciente eh, la reciente necesidad, ¿no? de, de, de elevar el contenido, o sea, el, la calidad visual de los productos, pues digamos que mm, El director de fotografía ha cobrado un nuevo papel eh, que está como que corre como en paralelo a, a la, al ascenso de la figura del escritor como showrunner. Okay, and now the DP has acquired a new role now that the streaming uh, platforms uh, need to produce uh, more and more. Therefore, the DP, as uh, Miguel sees it. Uh, has acquired a uh, larger uh, responsibility. Entonces, de repente hemos descubierto que la globalización es real, con la, gracias a las plataformas, eh, que, que, que de una forma nueva y novedosa eh, al, alcanzamos a millones de personas que, que proceden de culturas muy diversas y, y realmente nos ha caído encima la obligación de, de, de generar una, una identidad visual única y distintiva para cada, para cada show. Okay, so uh, with the globalization of uh, the platforms and the TV series, we have found out that millions of different people from different cultures uh, have gotten access to what we do. Therefore, uh, we need to generate uh, our own cultural identity and our own specific way of setting things out. Entonces, todo este concepto nuevo del visual designer, digamos que pivota en torno a otro concepto que es el de la identidad visual. Para mí la La identidad visual es la nueva, el nuevo objetivo ¿no? que tiene que vender un director de fotografía. Y, per, perdona, Carlos. Sí, yes, the, 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 this new concept about visual design uh, goes around what the visual identity must be. This is what the DOP must sell. It's a visual identity, and that's what it's uh, focused on. Entonces, claro, eh, efectivamente, yo yo me siento un poco como Adriano en el sentido de que no no entiendo que haya cambiado radicalmente 
el trabajo que hago. Eh, yo siempre he estado haciendo lo mismo. Lo único es que ahora como que hay un reconocimiento a eso. Y ciertamente yo a veces como que me he extralimitado en mis funciones como director de fotografía. Porque para conseguir una identidad visual poderosa tienes que entrar en diseño de sets, en vestuario, diseñar toda la paleta de color, incluso ir un poco más allá y intentar entender el momento social que viven los espectadores a nivel global y trasladar una visión casi espiritual del momento, ¿no? Y eso traducirlo en un diseño visual, ¿no? Ok, so Miguel feels uh, pretty much the same way as Adriano does, uh, that his role has not changed, but now that he is so much involved with this visual identity, he felt the need of getting more involved in uh, all different areas of the visual uh, film of the visuals that he is making. And this is a much wider responsibility that he has acquired on his new role of a uh, visual designer. Yes, I, I'd like to ask you, uh, Miga, uh, we, we talked the other day uh, about this and you said uh, in this your new role as, as a visual designer, you uh, um, on this series from one episode to another, directors will come and go. And uh, the way I understood what you were saying was that you, you felt almost closer to the writers of the show. Uh, is that yes. something you want to comment? Yes. Uh, finally, our, our first alliance is with the showrunner. Uh, we have to generate um, the, the, the enough trust and, and it's basically you, you have to resolve um his fears or his worries in the first <laughs> at, at, the, at the first and then you can um get the the freedom to to offer different proposals about the the look or the the visual design and the, the it's the, it's difficult to apply to to all the cases because you know uh, everyone has his own path, his own way. And I had working with the same showrunner um, from 10 years ago. So for me, it's very easy to, to, to get this freedom with him because he's, uh, he trusts in me. I, ha I, am, I, I, I want to, to help him and, and we, wo we work very well together. So it's a natural process for for us and and the the, the main reason is that directors uh, are changing all the time and finally the dop that is near from the showrunner is who try to keep the consistency and in the visual um, design of, of your show so it's not complicated it's in a natural way and I, it's, and I can, if happens. I can if I if I can jump in just just because yeah, I, really, kind, yeah. of, I kind of feel uh, somehow a connection to I just want to Miguel you correct me if I'm wrong but I just to explain a little bit it, Miguel's case is absolutely fair and but he had to be earned right so he was the GOP for the first and second seasons, if you correct me if I'm wrong, Miki. Yeah. And then because of his talent and because of his uh, uh, presence, actual presence on all creative discussions, he got what I, I would call an upgrade. So now he's not only the GOP, but he's also the visual style uh, keeper or supervisor. But yeah. that's, still, that's still an exception for the market. My, 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 Miki might be the only case, or maybe you know, might there might be two cases. Uh, for instance, even in my, and this is very much related to the authorship and the, and the residuals that we want to discuss. 
So I remember, I mean, I did The Crown from the very beginning, since season one, season one. And I have an extremely healthy relationship with the showrunner. Everybody else fears him. I never felt anything like, uh, like you know, any like a, a, a that I had to respond immediately, or I had to, I had to had answers to all his questions. I mean, it's been always a very uh, successful, healthy relationship. What I watch, and I I must I must say this is again I, I'm I'm talking uh, putting all these points because of the 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 authorship element. What we see, and I think Migi uh, will agree with me. We see the directors in like panicking of that possible the, the, the relationship with the showrunner. Oh, is that going to go well? Is he going to like my episodes? How uh, how how uh, um, how much can I protect my cut? So you watch during the season as a DOP directors coming and going and having sometimes a difficult time with the with the with the showrunner, yeah. and then you're also not only the DOP. The, uh, the head of department, but you're also now a psychologist. Sometimes you have yeah. to you have to give the director confidence. You know, we know what we're doing. I'm here. I know the style. I've been doing this for years and years now. So let's just. Uh, so I'm not saying that it's unbalanced, but sometimes we we it feels like we deserve some sort of credit for authorship. Because on a daily basis, you are making not only creative decisions, but very um, political decisions as well. I mean, how much coverage you need? Can we move on? Can we save time now and spend more time later? So there's a lot of those conversations happening all the way through. And I remember, which make me, makes me feel very you know, proud of the work I, I did on The Crown, is that I, I remember having uh, crew members coming to me saying, you should be a producer by now. You should have a producer credit. And I remember saying, this is not something you ask for. There's no negotiation possible where a GOP say, I want a producer credit so you can get some residuals. That needs to be offered to you like he was to Migue, proving how special his work on Casa de Papel has been. Because he made himself so important that even the producers, even the studio, Netflix, realizes yeah. We need someone like him on the show, right? Um, I felt all the way through on the crown, my work super valued. I always felt really respected. I was the guy, the GOP, to welcome new directors. Every new director that would come to the show, that was new to the show, Peter Morgan would say, the showrunner would say, so Adriano needs to shoot those, needs to shoot those episodes because he is carrying the style. He's the style keeper, right? Very much like Miguel's role, but without, let's say, official recognition, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. I don't mind, I, I'm not saying I mind that. I'm not saying that, you know, I, I felt, you know, uh, I felt there's an injustice there. I know my role and I knew that was my role when I signed the contract. So, you know, you have to accommodate to your choices sometimes well, that doesn't mean we don't want to change the, the, the rules. We don't want to change the market in a way so we can get a little bit more appreciation, financial appreciation for what we do. But like, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm loving to hear Miggy's story because I think it, that proves that the studios can really show appreciation, but effectively, effectively show appreciation for what we do. I don't really think that should be the case in every single show. I think there's probably 50, 60% of the series done all around the planet that even as a GOP, you just hire, you, you just come, you do a couple episodes, you have a short prep and you leave. But when you're the lead DOP or when you're the visual supervisor, style supervisor like Miga is, you have, to, you have to be somehow paid for that. Right or, or get residuals over your uh, addition. It is because it is an additional work. It's not just you're not just playing the DOP role. You're you know you're half producing, half co-directing, half uh, you know yeah. DOPing. So um, I don't. I also I don't want to somehow over boost what we do because it's 
for me, I really appreciate my job. I really appreciate my craft. So, uh, but I understand some rules need to change. Yeah. And uh, you, you used the other day, um, Adriano, the, the expression to protect the director. Mm -hmm. So could you explain that? Uh, it's basically what you've been talking about, but, but new directors come in and, and you're sort of the keeper of the, the visual style of it. Yeah, I think that what my experience uh, is, they usually struggle for the first week because they, because they haven't been to those sets. They're not familiar with the cast, but, but some, some of us are, right? It's like myself or the designer, or the camera operator eventually. So we've been there before. They usually struggle for the first week. And then when they start getting assemb assemblies for the first scenes we shot on the first week, and then you get some sort of a feedback from the showrunner, oh, then they, then they, they relax a little bit. They get more confident about what they're doing because now there's, you know, there's some sort of a response from the, the showrunner and the, and the script department. So protect the director in a sense means that uh, he doesn't need to overthink the framing, for instance, or camera moves, um, or uh, be use of wide angle lenses on a show like The Crown. I mean, there's a few rules that I'm always happy to present or remind the director. I mean, of course, we, we can do whatever you want, uh, uh, but, you know, because that's also my, one of the roles is to accommodate and to, you know, make them confident about their own choices, of course. But I think the first week is really vital when you welcome a new director to make, to make him or her feel that they belong to the crew right away. You know that the crew is there supporting them is not criticizing or over judging what they do because they're just starting so you have to just push and be be the crew somehow the crew leader supporting and sponsoring someone that is just coming and just arriving to the show right yeah is there uh, even any uh, sort of uh thoughts on accommodating the schedule so that the, the first two or three days for a new director are not the toughest scenes or the most challenging scenes or well i usually suggest that but that's yeah. more that's more on the first ad's and the producers because sometimes it doesn't really matter what you prefer i mean sometimes the, it's just a, a, a it's, it's driven or determined by location or cast availability but yeah. ideally yes you should start light yeah you should start on like short scenes and right. on stage, you know, where you have more control and yes, because sometimes on, on feature films you 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 design the schedule so you don't start with with really challenging stuff. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was thinking we have another subject here, and I think we have a slide for it: uh, the image decision power of a director of photography on a series. Uh, we, I mean, I, we've touched upon it, but uh, but maybe there's there is more to be said in more general terms. I think in general, I, I mean, not not specifically the two shows where where you you two do have rather uh, exclusive uh, power, I would say. But but in general, uh, DUP on a on a series. Um, how much in charge of the image is he or she these days? Mm. Sorry, it's to me that, sorry. No, no, please. Ah. Um, voy contigo, Carlos. <laughs> no, creo que, que el, el, poder, el poder de decisión de, de un director de fotografía sobre las imágenes tiene que ser todo el que sea posible. Eh, los límites creo que, que los tiene que determinar uno mismo y hasta que no moleste a los demás. Eh, y, y en mi caso, y creo que en el caso sobre todo de, de cinematografías que no están en primera línea, eh, hay que luchar mucho, sobre todo en la, la parte didáctica, ¿no? de, de, de comprometerse con la... O sea, hay que, hay que ofrecer que comprometerse con la factura visual y con el estilo visual eh, complejo te va a llevar a, a, a mejores puertos, ¿no? Es una herramienta de venta internacional. 
Entonces, eh, sorry, Carlos. <laughs> um, Miguel says that um, he believes the power of decision of a DOP must be as much as possible. That uh, those limits uh, must be determined by himself, by the DOP, as long as it does not bother other people. Uh, he must fight a lot for the uh, didactic or the teaching part of compromise to offer a real uh, visual uh, uh, style and look. Uh, that is what is really going to take you to a better result. Y, y esta ha sido mi, mi apuesta desde el principio, generar una identidad visual y además hacerle entender a los productores que, que si eso sucedía, los beneficios iban a ser grandes porque íbamos a entrar en una escala internacional. Yep, that has been his bet uh, to generate or to create a uh, visual identity. And he has been focused on making the producers understand it. Because if he does it, that is going to be a much easier way for the production to acquire an international scale. Entonces, digamos que, mmm, ¿cuál es la estrategia? La estrategia es involucrarse desde el principio en el proyecto, cuanto antes puedas. Iniciar conversaciones con los showrunners, por supuesto, los directores principales, pero también con los actores, con el, el production designer, el vestuario, todos los departamentos. Y siempre lo que he tratado de, de ofrecer yo es una especie de, de visión, porque lo que sí tenemos los directores de fotografía es la, la herramienta más poderosa con la que contamos es el poder de visualización. Y, y eso lo, lo he ejercido de una forma, digamos, extensiva, ¿no? Y, y, y he intentado no solamente visualizar la historia, sino visualizar cómo esa historia mmm, puede llegar a más personas, puede conectar con los espíritus del momento, del tiempo que estamos viviendo, con las inquietudes y los miedos de nuestra audiencia. Sorry, Carlos. <risa> uh, well... Miguel's uh, strategy is to get involved from the very beginning in the project. Uh, he must start uh, conversations with everyone, showrunners, directors, actors, production designers, and all different departments. Uh, what he feels that he has to offer is a vision. And the, that power of the visualization, he has... Uh, lived it in an extensive way, not only uh, to visualize this story, but to connect with the uh, uh, questions and well, the way of living even of uh, a lot of other people that are going to be watching the, the, the show. For example, when I was shooting Vis a Vis, that was our first uh, project with Alex Pina, the, the showrunner, uh, who I always wore him. Uh, I I was crying all the time in the set. Let's go do a global show, global show, people. Let's go to do a global show. And this vision that <laughs> of the global show uh, led to work in, uh, best and and to get best results. And uh, this area started to. To, to 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 become international and and started to um, to to sorry <laughs> you know and finally uh, that concept was the, the the idea for la casa de papel but from the beginning and that was the the process So, uh, Adriano, do you want to weigh in a little on this one? 
Yeah, well, yes, sure. I was actually thinking a little bit more about uh, stuff that I we we discussed previously. Um, that oh, it, it's related to the old role of a cinematographer and the new one. Um, I it is a little, of course, it's a little different. I mean, the the DOPs had not if not if not more power. There was a little bit more. I don't want to use the word glamour. But anyway, there was a little bit more of an aura over the GOP when we used to shoot in, on film, right? So it's a poor video tap in black and white. Uh, you're the first, you're the only, probably only person on the set actually watching what is the image su supposed to be or how close, you're the closest one to how the material you're going to see on the next day so it took 24 hours to process process the movie the sorry the film and then and then to cop to print it and then you, you take another 24 hours for you to be able to watch that with the director so on set there was this uh mystique around director of, of photography like you're a magician right you're the only one capable of interpreting your light meter, you know, the, the, the highlights and the dark and the shadows and et cetera. So there was a lot of uh, mystique, let's say, around the, the, the DOP. It is true that these days it's way more democratic in a sense that every department's got a monitor, usually a huge one, usually badly calibrated. So you know when you walk on set that people have, all people, everybody have an opinion about what you're doing. So it's, it's, so when I going back to Lars in terms of like giving support to the director is that because I am not nostalgic, necessarily nostalgic, I don't really miss that mystique. I don't really miss that power I used to have when I was shooting on film. I started on video. I started on television. Then I moved to film and then back to, let's say, television now. But one of one of my main efforts on set is to keep it uh, hierarchical, right? So there is a director, there is a director, and that should be the loudest voice, right? So even on when we play, like me and Migi, you play on a long series and then you know everybody, and then you feel that your importance and your creative power and your uh, you, in your in your powers that your power as a manager is also like growing and increasing and etc that doesn't mean that my my voice should be louder than the director when we're on set so one of the things is to keep supporting the director going back to that point means yes i might be the one carrying the the i, I might be the keeper of the style but there is a director on set, and this is still very much that same art we used to do like 10, 15 years ago when we, do, when we did it on film. So that's one of the things that for the new generation, like the youngsters that work with me on set, that's the message that I still try to pass on. Well, it is a little bit more democratic. Yeah, it, it is true, you can buy a 5D and, and shoot a film, but, but there's also this conception about leadership and and, and hierarchy that interests me a lot. I don't, I don't want to scramble that order. I don't want to scramble the hierarchy when I'm on set. It doesn't matter how much creative power I have. I still want to be directed by the director. So it's one of the, our roles, like when Miki talks about pre-production and how much early you have to get, get involved, is also to get to know that person well enough you know, to know how to work with that specific director in terms of delivering the best product possible, uh, exercising the best collaboration on set, etc. So there's a little bit of uh, this new new way of doing entertainment on shooting feature, uh, features and series because of the digital cameras doesn't have necessarily have to change the whole methodology, right? So we're still doing movies in a way. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that really adds to what Miguel said, but I, it, I felt to me that I should readdress the old cinematography role compared to the new one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, Adriana, I, I think that's a very interesting topic and I, I, I'd love to get back to it a little further on. 
because uh, it's interesting to see what were the uh, what was the old role and uh, how much of that is actually obsolete i mean some things have, have basically survived i think uh, but uh, um there's another topic here and i do believe we have a slide for it also the relationship between uh, dop and showrunner uh we've we've touched upon it uh already but perhaps we can do it in, in a more generic sense meaning if uh you're you're hired to to do an episode on a on a series so what's the relationship between uh the dup and the showrunner in that specific situation and uh anyone can begin me again uh, as i say before um my, my my relationship with the showrunner is based in the confidence and and we shall all um, for very wide working margins. Um, really, I, I have a great deal of autonomy in decision making and giving me the freedom to, to explore and develop the, the, the visual aesthetic. Um, mm, uh, finally, the, the, the showrunner has a lot of things to do. And, uh, in in the case of Alex Alex Pina, he's always t talking telling you the the histories and he's a script writer, so he has he want to put all the the force in the in the writing, and but he's supervising everything, and casting, editing, editing, musics, and I try to help him in, in the part of the visuals. So uh, I am overseeing all the decisions about the, you know, the, 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 the construction sets uh, and, um, sorry, I'm going to change to yeah, Carlos. Sí, <laughs> sí y realmente eh, le quito todo el peso relacionado con los departamentos más, más estéticos, ¿no? Peluquería, vestuario, efectos especiales eso no quita que es importante lo ha apuntado Adriano por supuesto este poder o, o supuesto poder se ejerce desde, desde la humildad máxima porque si no no sería consistente ni llevadero o sea yo tengo que hacer que el production designer sienta que brilla cada vez que trabaja o que el, el, el la persona que hace el vestuario esté dando lo mejor de sí. Oh, y, y ese es realmente mi trabajo. Es que tan, es fácil de malinterpretar eh, esta nueva figura, ¿no? Si queremos que sea una figura. Si no queremos que sea una figura, pues nada, yo puedo seguir siendo director de fotografía. No, no tengo ningún problema. No, no me inventé yo la, la, el cargo. A mí me lo propuso Netflix. Mm, sorry. Carlos. Muy bien. Um, well, what Miguel says is that one of his main uh, roles is to uh, take a lot of weight from the showrunner about the set design itself. That way, the show designer that, is ha that has got a lot of things to do in the filmmaking uh, is going to be uh, having a much better ally and Mige and in the DOP than if he had to do everything himself. So he will take a, a, a real uh, specific role on the set design, on the wardrobe, and a lot of different issues that were not usually assumed by the DOP. And that way he's gonna be able to help the role of everyone. Now, one main thing that Mega mentions is that it's, it is not him who must be the one getting the success out of it. If the, ward, the, the wardrobe person or the set designer or everyone involved that he's helping with does not feel that he's the one that did it, that he's the one that deserves the, the recognition, he's not doing his job well. 
So one of the main things he does is make sure that everyone involved is going to feel that he is doing his job. And it's not uh, a recognition that must be given to me, but to himself. Y, uh, y, sorry. <laughs> y ciertamente, como decía Adriano, antes había una especie de, de, mistiza, de mística alrededor de, de los directores de fotografía, ¿no? Eh, actualmente, o sea, sí que, eh, no sé cómo explicarlo, pero mm, en mi caso ha habido una promesa de, de, de éxito, se podría decir, ¿no? Y, y eso se ha confirmado, podría haber sido un error, pero sobre el concepto de identidad visual y trabajando muy duro ese concepto, es como hemos conseguido eh, vender las series internacionalmente. Y eso ha traído prosperidad a la industria española, en el caso de España. Imagino que ha sucedido lo mismo, no sé, eh, con el juego del calamar, por ejemplo. Entonces, mmm, digamos que he aprovechado la, la sinergia o la, o la identidad que había de, del director de fotografía con cierto chamán en el set, como para. Eh, usándolo de otra forma, eh, más psicológica, ¿no? de, de generar un impulso creativo colectivo, que por supuesto mm, abandero, pero no soy el, el, el motor en la propia gente, eh, para conseguir lo que has conseguido con la Casa de Papel. Y, y, y es lo que yo he vivido y es el ejemplo que, que puedo poner. ¿no? Yes. Can I, can I just say, Carlos? Uh, yes. Carol, if, if you'll uh, if you'll uh, uh, if you'll uh, translate that last part, and then we were thinking about having a uh, a, a short break here, so everyone can get fresh coffee or, or or whatever they need to do for just I think five minutes. Is everyone okay with five minutes? Yeah. Okay. So, Carlos, if you'll just uh, if you'll just do that the translation there, and then we'll take a five minute break after that. Okay, well, uh, Miga says that the way that Adriano was uh, speaking a, a little bit ago, there is a certain mythical way of looking at the DOPs. And uh, there has always been a certain promise about uh, his role, his or her role, uh, working based on that concept of global uh, look and uh, cultural understanding Uh, looking for international audiences is how he has been able to sell those uh, like money heist or those TV series worldwide. So uh, he thinks that that is the same thing that it's been obtained in some other different places. He does not think that it's just himself, but that is something that has been done elsewhere. And that has generated a collective impulse that he is in front of it, but, he, but, but it is the motor of everyone else that he works with to be able to get what he's achieved. Okay, thank you. Dimi. Dimi, are you there? That's... Should, we take a, should we take a five minute break here? Yes, is everybody ready to go? Uh, yeah. Okay. Mige, so... Mige, Mige is still coming back. Yeah. There, there is an interesting question on the Q&A here. Yes. By, uh... Well, I had it now, lost it. Uh, I was thinking uh, the one from Irene there because it was directed yeah. to me. Well, the other one disappeared. It was from Ricardo, Ricardo de Garcia. Okay. I'll answer later then. I'm It's... here, guys. I, I was uh, responding to Ricardo de Garcia. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay, good. I was going to say, Miguel, if uh, Ricardo is uh, still on, online, Uh, that is, I, I, I'd, I'd say it's quite relevant for me to say that 
I can only I can only offer my experience, right? I that's why I think it is yes, Ricardo. Yes, of course, it can change. It can vary a lot from production to production. Depends a lot on who's the showrunner, how successful he is, or how much ownership he's got over his uh, show and his episodes, and how open to collaboration he is. It, yes, it is also true. I mean, for instance, you cannot call it a TV series, but it's definitely a series on the Harry Potter movies. The only artist that stayed for all the movies were the production, was the production designer. Directors and DOPs would come and go. The designer was the only one, Stuart Craig, I think is his name, that did all 10 movies or how many, how many they did. So it does, of course, it does vary. It varies also according to the budget, according to how many episodes you're doing, or it changes all the time. So we're not kind, I don't think that the purpose of the meeting is to establish uh, new rules. I think we're just discussing personal experiences and how we perceive our role, our roles, and, and then we can eventually discuss if we consider ourselves um, valued enough uh, politically, artistically, and financially? I mean, those are the questions we were open to discuss, but I, I'm not sure if we have the answers, right? So yeah, it does vary a lot depending on the show you're doing. It does. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it, the same for me. It's, it depends to, to many, to many um, elements. Is are different ways to to reach the same places, and for me, I I I am um, listening to you, Adriano, Adriano, and probably you are the visual designer of the crown. I, I don't know if you want to, <laughs> but it's difficult to 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 say that word. Yeah, in my case, it's the same. It's, I I don't feel yeah. comfortable with this new role. Because I, I am doing the same. Oh. No, you should, because you deserve it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, also, I'd say the visual, it really depends on, for instance, the, one of the most important things in terms of like your importance, artistic importance, is if you're telling, if, if you're doing a series, let's say it's 10 episodes, but it's one 10 hour story, just one story shot by different DOPs, then the conversation between the DOPs has to be really close and tight. And they probably need some, some sort of a visual um, supervisor, right? That is either the lead DOP, the, the, whoever started on the show or, or the, uh, the showrunner or eventually one of the directors. If, we're telling different stories. So you have 10 episodes, but there's, time, let's say, on The Crown, for instance. Yes, it's the same period, but it's not the same story. You're not telling the same story yeah. in 10 hours. They, they're episodic. So although there is a visual style to be followed, they can also be creative in, for individual episodes because one is in Scotland, the other one is, you know, is the, the foggy, the foggy episode like we had on season uh, one or two. So it's just this special event in London when the, the city is covered in smog or whatever. So yes, there is, a, there is a visual style, but there's room for variations. Like the, the, the Star Wars show I did, it is one 10 hour story, but the, the character jumps from planet to planet. So also there's a little bit of freedom for individual DOPs and, and directors because their episodes in like, you know, different location. It, it, it already has a different visual style. One is green because it's exterior. The other one is all done on set. So it's, so that's, I'd say one is one 10 hour story. The connection between all the, the creatives involved in a show need to be much tighter, much more precise. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and, and sometimes uh, this rule, this role, uh, could be occupied by a production designer or um, UFX supervisor, or you know. Uh, but the, the 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 thing is that 
from the cinematography, you can say a lot of things and you can empower your, your show. So it's another angle to, to do that. It's only that. Okay, uh, I, I, um, I wanted to go fetch a thing here, just um, Miguel, would you want to, to answer the question that uh, Irene sent before, perhaps Carlos? Irene. Yes, yes. yes. Carlos, you could just uh, run it quickly in English. ¿Cuál es la diferencia real en el set? Yes, you're, between the, sorry. You're sorry, muted, Carlos. Carlos. It's written in English. She says, hi, Miga here, Irene. Understanding that the visual designer is a mix between the DP and the producer. What is the real difference on set and design between the visual designer and the production designer? Okay, um, I'm going to, I, I'm going in Spanish. Um, eso es un punto clave y es que la función de este visual designer no interfiera o no, no, no atraviese posiciones de otras figuras de, involucradas en, en la producción, ¿no? Y eso cobra especial importancia con el production designer, ¿no? Sí que es cierto que en España eh, no ha habido la tradición de production designers como ha habido en el mercado anglosajón. Eh, aquí los denominamos directores de arte. Y, y sí que es cierto que mm, yo, yo he intentado mm, al revés, promocionar la figura de su trabajo, o sea, la figura del director de arte y hacer que su trabajo brille y se eleve. Eh, el production designer, perdón, el, el visual designer realmente trata de, de enmarcar el, el, el aspecto visual con un trazo amplio, un trazo ancho. Digamos que hacemos el bol de, de la historia. Dentro de esos límites y de ese marco, eh, es obligado para el director de arte o production designer poner toda su creatividad y, y, y ampliar ese, ese concepto todo lo que pueda, efectivamente. En la casa de... Perdona, Carlos. Sorry, Carlos. I'm trying, Miguel. I'm trying to follow on. Um, well, what Miga says is that it's a very, very relevant and important point that uh, Irena mentions. Uh, the, the purpose of visualizing does not interfere with other positions or other uh, people involved in the production. It is especially important with a production designer. In Spain, uh, there no, the, the figure or the name of the production designer has not been relevant in, in the industry. Uh, in, in Spain, it is art directors, the ones that they work with. Uh, the visual designer is the one that is uh, conceiving the visual aspect with a wide uh, visual uh, attitude and approach. Uh, within that, being that said, it is an obligation for the production designer to widen as much as possible what the visual designer is offering. So it is most important again, that everyone shines with what they do, not just the visual designer or the DOP. Entonces, okay, en el, yes. sorry, no, en, en el, uh, only a thing that, eh, en el caso específico de la Casa de Papel, eh, yo estuve hablando de crear una estética eh, con una arquitectura totalitaria. Y estuvimos viendo, por ejemplo, el Valle de los Caídos en Madrid, que es donde está enterrado Francisco Franco, y estuvimos viendo esas dimensiones y estuvimos mmm, valorando esa estética. Fue lo único que yo marqué. El expresionismo, los contrapicados y la, y la arquitectura totalitaria. Con lo cual, 
esos contrapicados hacían que lo, los techos fueran las nuevas paredes. Ese era el concepto. Otro concepto importante es los suelos hay que concederlos a la maquinaria para no montar vías y ir muy rápidos. Entonces, son directrices muy leves. Después, bueno, por supuesto, la paleta de color. Pero eh, toda la creatividad, toda la eficiencia que tiene la dirección de arte de la Casa de Apple, el mérito es totalmente de los directores de arte. You go. First, Carlos. So, so uh, Miguel's talking about money haste, or La Casa de Papel. Uh, he was talking about creating an architecture that was uh, totally Terry. Uh, they were seeing the Valle de los Caídos, which is the place where Fa Francisco Franco is buried. And the expressionism, the structure is uh, totally Terry. It's, uh, it's something that he has offered as very subtle or subtle things, but the, the, the ceilings are the new walls. The floors uh, have, have been given to the machinery that he's working with. It, it is subtle work on his direction, but the creativity and the, the, what, what has really been Uh, the the motor of this creation is the art directors. Okay, uh, we are actually in a. Uh, can I can I just say something just before yes, we move yes. on? Yes. I, I just I just want to flag, stress. Let's say the opportunity we're having here because it's this new role that Mige is now performing. I'm, I'm, I, can, I, can pro, I, can, I think I can say is unique. I haven't heard of anything like this before. Even like, let's say even on my case, after six seasons on The Crown, I mean, the offer that was made to him by Netflix and the understanding of his capacity and his role, it's an amazing upgrade. It's an amazing opportunity for us DOPs to grow up grow up professionally and artistically because the usual promotion for someone like us is to become a director, right? So you know the yeah. show so well, you shot 10 episodes or you shot six seasons or whatever. So now you know everything, you know everybody. So why don't you just get a couple of episodes to direct? And some of us don't want to do that. So one example, sorry, because I don't remember his name, is this, I'm going to say, young GOP that did Uh, the, maybe the first season on Yellowstone and he did so well that he's now directing not episodes he's now the, directing the whole series and so that's the most usual start of promotion for DOPs when you get engaged for a long period of time with showrunners then producers and etc they offer you a, a, an episode to direct and that changes your relationship with your crew with the showrunner with the producers, with the actors. And I think what for some of us, that is an upgrade. You want to become a director. You want to have more power. You want to have you know, the, 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 the cut. Uh, or, or, you know, have to, you, you, want to, you want to be the storyteller, the main storyteller behind the, a series or an episode. I, myself, I, I had the opportunity when I did City of Men, the series. This is like 20 years ago. I did the whole se I, I did all seasons and I ended up directing two episodes because I knew the cast and it was something yeah. that I was going to, I wanted to try. And then since then, I keep saying, no, I love what I do and I just want to do it, whatever, more with more intensity and uh, with more time and with more money, basically. So I think what Miguel is showing us, show, actually really showing the world is that there is, there are other options. You know, you can actually progress as a GOP uh, by doing what you do. You don't need to change to another job, to another profession, to feel uh, important in a sense, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I feel, I can feel that, that credit as a, a tool of, of protection for, for my work because sometimes, you know, uh, 
there, there, is, there is a new director in the TV show, and he wants to, to, to do um, other stuff, different stuff. Yeah. Different stuff. And you can say him, sorry, but we are doing another thing. And you, you, you can't deconstruct the system, the, yeah. the, the look or the or the yeah. other. You have to, to, to go with us. This is a collective uh, work. Mm -hmm. And for me now, I have the tools to say, hey, sorry, the start. And it, it, it's in the same level of conversation. It's, it's not, I am the, direct, the director, I, let's go to do. And of course, I, I, I try to maintain all the time the hierarchy, have you said to the, uh, before, between the director and the DOP, it's obvious because mm -hmm. it, it doesn't work in, in another form in, in, in on the set. Uh, you have to to maintain a voice, and the main voice is of course the director voice. So um, that's the point. It's only a, another um, tool to to maintain the the consistency in the visual design in the in the in the um, you know, the, the, the lack of the, the show. Yes, uh, guys, we, we have sort of a luxury problem here, I would say, because we said uh, we wanted to reserve the, the last half hour for questions, and we have a ton of questions. So I was thinking if we could just, uh, there's a subject that I'd, I'd like to touch on, and if we could just uh, use uh, like four minutes or something very briefly for that. And uh, Demi, I was thinking, Demi, could you, uh, uh, we had one called the, the new role of the DP and, uh, and there was uh, opportunities, new fields here. Uh, no, not, not this one, uh, the new role of the DP, it's further down, it's one of the last, I think. If you, no, 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 uh, Demi, <laughs> further down. Oh, anyway, we could, we just, we could do, do it without the slide. We, I was just thinking of uh, uh, we were talking earlier about the the role of the DP in the in the days of film where we were sort of a magician. You were the only one who knew what this is going to turn out like. And now, of course, uh, there's the whole new playing field here. And uh, I was thinking in terms of of uh, pros and cons in a way. Of course, there are many new opportunities, and we discussed some of them. Uh, there's also I think there's also a, a vulnerability perhaps to the DP in the new role in that, Adriana, you said they're like, everyone has a monitor and they're not correctly calibrated and everything. So, uh, uh, and also things, stories I've heard myself from colleagues that uh, everyone's watching the, the monitor and you're lighting the set and, and the people go, oh, that's, that's fine. We can see this is fine. Let's start shooting now. And you wanted to light for another half hour. So, um, so if just keeping it briefly, do you want to say something about the vulnerability of the new uh, DP role, and also about the opportunities? I mean, uh, there, there, among the opportunities, there are so many ways of doing something now. Back back in the day, you, you had maybe a, a fixed set of tools, and now the DP becomes almost more of a problem solver, or or suggest we could do it this way, we could do it that way. Back in the day, maybe there were three or four ways of doing it. Now there's a myriad of ways. So pros and cons of the new role. <laughs> so yeah. add on. I, well, I, I, sorry, I, I just, in, in, a, in, a, in the very best way, Lars, I, 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 I think I wanna say, I, I think I am a problem solver. And I don't think that is a bad thing. I mean, no, it's, no, no, no. it's one of it's one of our main roles. Is sometimes be the one that it, it cooks all different ideas somehow and say, well, why don't we take this this road instead of that road? I think the vulnerability. I'd say it's more related to uh, the ambitions and the actual reality of a specific day or a specific show. I mean, when you, when you get to work with directors and producers uh, that come with the more is more 
sort of philosophy. You know, so let's, let's grab a bag, a, a big bag of shots. Then, then we can decide later uh, what's the style, what's the rhythm, what's the pace. This is an, they, they, they push all the main aesthetical and, and, and rhythm decisions to editorial, right? Just grab a, just a big bag of shots. So yes. that is when I feel a little bit more vulnerable because you know you're going to have less time per setups that you want to, uh, right. and you're going to have to rush and you in, inevitably going to be late at the end of the day, because it's more, you need more. I need another size. I need a tighter close up. And, yeah. and then you start asking the questions. Why, why do you need it? Why do you need to go again? Why do you need another size or whatever? So that yeah. sometimes can create a little bit of conflict. And that's when you feel vulnerable because you eventually have to step back and say, okay, so let's do this other size. Let's do another close up. So uh, that's when I feel a little bit more vulnerable is that because it's TV in a sense. So it makes sense to, to get some, some sort of fat, you know, some additional coverage. So you don't struggle too much when you're cutting your, your show. Uh, but what I fight very hard during my prep is for some sort of a commitment, a visual commitment stroke a style right stroke pace so what is the pace we want for the show is this a cutty show no this is not action adventure this is the crown so we're not we shouldn't be pursuing just coverage because because who knows what, how peter morgan is going to feel no no in the scene what is the scene about so that's the question i usually ask so how this scene helps us to move forward what is the main line that needs to be on screen. So all those relevant questions need to be asked up front, because if you start asking those questions on a daily basis on set, you create some sort of a confrontation, creative confrontation with your director. So I, I'd say to reduce your vulnerability, you have to be able to decipher your director during prep. Who is he or she, the taste, the pace, you know, I usually, I usually myself deal with what I call anti-references. It's not stuff that we want to see on the show. It's stuff that we absolutely don't want to see on the show, right? So fake backlights or close-ups on wide-angle lenses. So basically, you try to, on prep, you try to eliminate stuff that you don't want. So you reduce the options you have on the day i mean i don't want to be professional in terms of like how we do our work but it, it, it that that there are subtle ways to protect your work on set and i'd say it's the more you discuss the story and the style on prep so that's read the script read the script take the director to the locations walk around you know just ask questions ask questions try to dig something that is you can then relate to and explore you know yeah yes hey. Miggy, you want to weigh in on this one uh, briefly or eh sí eh Carlos voy contigo <laughs> eh realmente o sea comparto todo lo que ha dicho Adriano eh sí que el principal el principal, la principal vulnerabilidad de un director de fotografía, sobre todo en una, en una serie que son en mucho tiempo, puede estar rodando ocho meses fácilmente, es la, la ansiedad. La ansiedad de lo que pueda ocurrir y tú no puedas tener preparado o prevenido. Luis Carlos. Ok, uh, Miguel agrees with everything that Adriano has said. Uh, he feels that the main vulnerability of a DOP is anxiety. And that is the anxiety of everything that might happen and you might not have a way to solve. Entonces, yo siempre intento, bueno, mi, en mi receta particular intento construir un sistema, un sistema compartido principal, o sea, creado con el showrunner y con el director principal 
y después compartido con el resto de directores. Okay, so, so his main objective is to create a system that is shared with the showrunner, the director, and then later on with the rest of the other directors. Y ese sistema incluye eh, una especie de documento que, que, que marque las pautas de lo que se va a rodar y una especie de reglas para todos, ¿no? Y, y, y en eso también se fundamenta el concepto de identidad visual. Ok, so, so Mega says that system includes a, a kind of a document that will establish the rules of what is going to be shot. And in that document is where it's going to be explained what the visual identity will be like. Y por ejemplo, sorry. No, no, go. Please, Adriano. No, no, Miguel, Miguel, please. No, y, y, por ejemplo, se queda ya clara eh, cosas tan simples como la paleta de color o las ópticas que se van a usar. O, por ejemplo, decimos no se va a usar una Steadicam. Entonces no puede venir un director a decir, no, quiero una Steadicam. Tiene que ser para algo muy concreto, como subir unas escaleras. Yep, so, so that's when it's all laid out with simple things like the color uh, that is going to be used, what optics are going to be used. Uh, for example, if they're not going to be using steady cam, so nobody's going to come in with the idea of using one, unless very specific uh, shots like going up a stair, a stairway. Entonces, todo lo que está dentro de ese sistema, decimos que está en formato. Lo que no está fuera dentro de ese sistema, está fuera de formato. Y advertimos claramente de que eso supone o más tiempo, o más dinero, o otras cosas que no tenemos. Ok, so everything that is within that system is within the format. And whatever is not, is out of the format. So if anyone wants to come in with something that is not in that document, uh, will might require more time, more money, or anything else that uh, might come up. Sorry, Adriano. You... I, I was just going to say that I, I didn't do any Game of Thrones episodes, but I, I know, because I know a lot of people that did, that they you would get to Belfast, whatever, if you're a director or even a DOP, when you're starting on your episodes or the season and you would find on your hotel bedroom uh, literally a book like a bible delivered by the showrunners with a visual research some 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 rules uh, even like the lenses we're using on this season etc etc so so that i'm just saying this because i i'm so enthusiastic about what Mige achieved Uh, that so there was like the, the, the show obsessive showrunners on Game of Thrones used to deliver Bible visual Bibles. Now we have a DOP, a colleague of ours, doing the same sort of, of job. And I, I think this is an, an amazing step that we, we're, we're watching here. So I hope I have this. I, 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 I yeah, I it's, it's really amazing that everybody knows that Migi is in charge of the format. You know, it's, it's um, amazing, an amazing step for all of us. And yeah. hopefully, hopefully Migi's work here can be a precedent and, uh, and open up this possibility on, on, on future projects as well. Yeah. Oh, no, please. Yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> that, that new role, uh, uh, you, you have a lot of work all the time. <laughs> you are working. So, It's not maybe this arrival state for a DOP. You have to, <laughs> to maintain <laughs> your, your brain very clean about <laughs> because it's crazy. It's too much work to supervise everything. And yeah. <laughs> finally, it's, you can't do that for, I don't know how many years, but not for, two, for all the life because you don't have time to, to, to right. live. So, That's and, the important and, thing that is the... And, and Mige, just a question before I think we move to the, the, the Q&A. Yes. Are you, when, you, when you play the role as the visual uh, supervisor, do you also shoot episodes as a GOP? Yes. On the same season? Are you doing? Yes. Okay. yes. So it is... I, 
it's hard yes. work. Yeah, I I should I should uh, the 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 first time that we we will go to a set, I I should shoot it, and even I I mark the the F stop to work inside. Uh, this is um, four or two way two point eight, and uh -huh. and basically. My, um, all the uh, supervision supervise su ah, sorry <laughs> no i i supervise all the sets i have my um autocad mm -hmm. i i look everything and and do the work for the um lighting integrated lighting practicals all the practicals and we are manufacturing all the practicals too i have a department doing all the lights Right. To, to so the 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 construction sets and the cinematography is playing together. The window is here and the door is here and the scene. You know you you can put the the limits to the to the cover uh, mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to the to the directors doing the set. <laughs> I always say, please, I don't like the the. Mm, I, I like the 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 sets in a rectangular form with the windows to the side. And you can do you you can do this, but not too much. Uh -huh. Please let's do let's shoot this in, in a perpendicular way, orthogonal way. Uh, the windows are here because if you put the camera in front of the of the in the middle of the windows, you have problems. You have a shadow of the micro. Uh, you know, everything is difficult. This is a TV show, so let's yeah. do it a little more easy. You have time for everything, but let's try to do the right mode but in an easy way. And all the time I'm taking decisions about the colors to maintain the, the tonal contrast for me is very important. If you, okay, you can do with the practical lights and failing lights to, to, to let the camera move and shoot everything, but you have to to maintain the 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 tonal contrast. So the walls they have this color and this tone, two points um, and down to the, the the skin and you know all, all these things and and I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I lost now. Okay. No, but you you have to and uh, another thing important is you have the lat in the lat you preserve the the look of the yeah. of your show. For me, True. the lat is like the umami. So I I am using uh, um, always the same lat with little transformations, very little in the, the greens and the, the the shoulder and a little bit back. But it's, it's, it's always the same cure, show, mm -hmm. show, and show. And for me, it's a, a, a way that I can control everything and to maintain the, the look. And doesn't matter that I can work with a lot of DOPs. I, I can invite, <laughs> and I love a lot of DOPs here in Spain. I, I want to work with him, with this and, and, and this one. And I can invite them to explain the, the, the visual identity and, and I delegate um, mm. all, all this work. But I maintain with the construction sets the, the, and the, the post-production supervision because I, I, I am grading all the, sh all the episodes in, in the show. It's another way to, to maintain the control. Yeah, but yeah. It's not a real control. The, the DOP can do everything. Mm -hmm. But finally, I put all together and grade all the different voices, all the different visions. And it, it works like a product. Uh, you know, this is mm -hmm. the show. And, mm -hmm. and there is the, unity in the end. Yeah. Yeah. The consist consistency, sorry. Consistency, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is the best thing for a show. 
you you have to feel that it's the same show that it's a solid show and the the visual identity is fundamental for me it's, i am working always over the same concept one could say, Miguel, that uh, in supervising the grading at the end, you're you're a little like uh, the conductor of a symphony orchestra. There are, there are many different many different uh, instruments, many different DOPs on the various episodes, but you supervise the whole there. Yeah, yeah. I I only say, please, uh, daylight mm, five thousand, for example, and the nights three thousand and eighty. I, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, <laughs> yeah. 800. Yeah. Controlling the color temperature, everything looks similar. Yes. So the, the decisions about the, the light direction or the, the contrast about, okay, all the people is free and we have freedom to, to create and to, you know, to work. That finally there is little, things that we have to maintain to, you know, to maintain the, the uniformity. Yes. I think we have to go to uh, the, the, the Q&A now, and we are in uh, uh, the pleasant situation here that we have tons of questions. We, we have more questions than we can answer, I think. So I would almost suggest that uh, Migi and Adriano, you can see in the chat all the questions there. Uh, yeah. I would almost suggest that you guys look a little there and just pick one each or two each or something and try to do something quickly with them. I think that may be the best way to do this. Um. <laughs> you find a good one there, Adriano? Um, I, I saw one, I'm just trying to find it again. Uh, it was something about, because the question was unclear to me. Oh, here, from Daniel Stealing. Um, can you break down the DOP rule during prep on volume shots as it pertains to oh. the volume content? Uh, oh, sorry. So the, me, the volume meaning the the the... the the, the one they use on uh, Mandalorian, is that correct? Yeah, yeah virtual what... production, I guess, yeah. Oh, so I'm sorry, Daniel, I'm not a specialist. I haven't used it. I mean, even on uh, Andor, the Star Wars series that I did, we didn't use the same uh, strategy. I mean, we just shot it, you know, everything we had was built. I mean, there was one time we had a massive LED screen outside just on a, with a skyline, basically. So we didn't use the volume. Um, at all. I mean, all Disney shows, uh, although Mandalorian is a very su successful one, they didn't even ask us to use the same technology. So we went more uh, organic, let's say, build sets. Eh, ahora mismo estamos preparando en la productora un, un volumen LED eh, de 18 metros de largo por 6 de alto. Eh, y me parece muy interesante esta pregunta porque realmente eh, está relacionando muchas cosas, ¿no? ¿Traduces, Carlos? Right now they're preparing a large volume in the production house and uh, he finds it very interesting because it is putting together a lot of different things. Entonces, eh, realmente... Mmm, Estamos tardando mucho en, en, en digamos, eh, calibrar todo, ¿no? Pero estamos haciendo una cosa maravillosa y es que estamos usando la propia luz del volumen para iluminar. Entonces, hemos hecho unos paneles grandes de unos 3 metros por uno y medio, que son las dimensiones máximas que podíamos hacer, de, de paneles reflectores. Entonces, estamos multiplicando los efectos de luz y el movimiento de... de, de De, de la pantalla, ¿no? Y, y, y está siendo muy increíble. Uh, guys, I, I found a brilliant question, I think, here. If you feel it. Oh. 
I'll, I'll let, let Carlos traduce. Yeah, please. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll yeah, translate yeah. what Mika said. Uh, yeah. That they started by calibrating everything, and they're doing a very wonderful thing to use the same uh, light of the that comes out of the LED screens to light the set. They're using uh, sight uh, screens of three meter by one point five meter. Uh, making it much more interesting and having the actual uh, background light the set. Entonces, la parte interesante es que estamos usando eh, inteligencia artificial para crear fondos. Y lo más divertido, o no sé cómo llamarlo, eh, es que está funcionando. Y eso nos vuelve a situar en el debate de estamos recuperando de nuevo los directores de fotografía el control de nuestros fondos porque en una green screen la estábamos cediendo al departamento de VFX lo que siento con la pantalla LED es que de repente sobre todo si estás con Unreal Engine por ejemplo tú puedes ajustar los cielos puedes hacer un amanecer puedes volver a crear tú la luz y eso entra en cámara entonces de repente otra vez, ¿cuál es el nuevo papel del director de fotografía? Porque realmente estamos generando estos fondos o estamos dirigiendo esos fondos. De hecho, lo estoy creando yo con inteligencia artificial en, en mi portátil. Estamos abriendo de nuevo ¿no? la posibilidad de creación de, de control de la imagen. Y una cosa muy interesante, yo he llegado a esto de los volúmenes LEDs Justamente porque Netflix me llamó porque no funcionaban ciertos volúmenes LED con los que estaban trabajando. El punto último, a pesar de que la, la tecnología avance y, y, y sea eh, como muy complejo estar al día de todo, el punto último es que necesita el gusto y la sensibilidad que normalmente tienen los directores de fotografía para que la luz y la integración funcione. Y ahí de repente, cuando parecía que no, los directores de fotografía vuelven a ser indispensables. And I think there's a lot of oh, perdón, Carlos. Sorry. Yes, I'll, 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 I'll translate. The most interesting part is that they are using artificial intelligence to create the backgrounds, and that is quite fun because it is working. The DOPs are recovering the, the control of the backgrounds. With Unreal Engine, the DOP can create the backgrounds, the light, reproduce what they, what they want. What, which is the new role of a DOP, that means that they're creating the backgrounds. They're opening the possibility of creating the image itself. Uh, he, he came to uh, work on volumes and LED volumes because Netflix called him because it was not working. What they were doing was not working. So the, the crucial point here is that it requires the taste, the flavor and the sensibility of DOPs to make it all integrate and work. Okay. Uh, that, uh, yes. I, I was just going to say because there's so many questions about pre production. Uh, and whenever you work on the volume, uh, that's another thing that I think Mig is going to agree with me. The producers have to understand it's a different kind of prep. You need, mu you need much more time, you need much more technical, more, much more test time. So it has to be when when you say we're going to do this on the volume, you you as a GOP you have to either, if it's not there you have to fight for your prep time, because that's when you learn that's when you fine tune your your backgrounds that's when you eventually even go and shoot something that is better than the, the footage that was offered to you before. So it, it it implies on a different sort of prep for all of us. Yeah. Yes, uh, there's a, uh, a question here from uh, Jaume uh, who asked, uh, this is like 12 minutes past seven, uh, asks what schools you guys would recommend for someone interested in cinematography 
well, it immediately comes to mind Carlos school in uh, Colombia there, I think. But, but seriously, do you guys have uh, any preferences there or? Well, we've got a big advantage. Both Alfonso and Adriana are teachers at our school. And the big advantage is that we own a rental house. So we've got all kinds of different equipment that are actually being used in the large productions. So when you come out of our school, you have gotten to know what equipment is being used and how to handle it. But I would say that uh, there are so many great schools. NFTS, I think, in London is an awesome school. Uh, you, you get them in, in Poland and you have them all, all over the world. I think the main thing is to really be convinced of what you want to do and put a lot of yourself into it. That's yeah. what will take you farther. Good. Yeah. We, we have a, a little time left, and, and there was a, a question here which I found so intriguing because it's a kind of a, a, a little bit impertinent. So I think it, it, it should be taken with a, with a, a little bit of humor here because uh, there's um, uh, an Adrian Perez Reyes here who asks that uh, Adriano and, and Miguel and Carlos, of course, as well, you're all very well established, successful, experienced, and so does it occasionally happen to you that you suffer imposter syndrome? That you find yourself in a situation where you, you feel, I have no idea how to do this? Sorry? Yeah. Well, frequently. Yeah, I, I guess so. But, but, <laughs> but how do you handle it? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, the, the, I have, for me, it's not, it's, not, it's not difficult. And I'd say this is something I practice kind of a, with confidence. I'm always happy to throw away the first idea. So your first approach to a problem or to a scene, uh, and if it eventually gets rejected by the director, for instance, ah, and I was thinking about something different. I never struggle too much to actually say, okay, so let's hear you. And then I'll, maybe I can bring a little bit of my idea back to and join and, and merge the two ideas. But like, I mean, there's, there's an, it, it, uh, uh, Lars, I mean, it could be responding the question in kind of a many possible ways. I mean, there's the technical challenges, for instance. So you get to you get to a location and you realize, oh, I really needed a crane today, and I didn't order one. So what do you do? You improvise, or uh, that's one thing. It's a technical challenge or something that you regret not do not having done. The other one is a proper, for instance, uh, when I even on the crown. And after having worked with so many direct, the directors, I ended up now, the very last episode I just finished on, last episode of the last season, was directed by Stephen Daldry. And I had him at the very beginning, and then he left to do other stuff, and then he came back now. And he comes with an entire different methodology. I mean, he's a theater man, so he sees every set as a stage, so he needs, and, and nobody's supposed to be static. He doesn't like that. So everybody's moving all the time, always with a, re, with a reason. So it's not just like they're dancing. I mean, you move from A to B, because that's what you see in, on the stage in, in theater plays. So th there is a, always a reason for an actor to move. There's a specific line. Anyway, that made my life way more challenging. I mean, how can I be absolutely sure that every time they stop, the light is going to be okay. Like Miguel said, we try it up front when you're rehearsing a scene to bring them closer to the window or spin, spin the dialogue so that both side lit, there's no one front lit and the other one is back lit, for instance. So you fight for some sort of a, uh, a strategy to make it more beautiful and sometimes, because it's TV, faster, faster to shoot. So those are, for me, Ch real challenges you can find you can you can face every single day choreography how much the actors are moving and what is the coverage for that specific choreography but i mean challenges i mean i wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for the challenges to be honest i love the i love to be challenged i love to feel like oh now i need to find an answer for this question you know to to find myself on my comfort zone 
is something that is not interesting to me because not even on the crown after six seasons, it, it's so big and it's so intense with so many sequences per episode that it felt challenging all the way through for all the years I, I've done it. I always felt very, very much challenged and pushed by the, by the show, by the directors, by the showrunner. It's supposed to be difficult, I'd say. Thank you very much, Adriano. Uh, if, can if, I just interrupt? Uh, sorry, uh, Lars, just to say yeah. that we can go over uh, a little bit with some 20 minutes. Okay, because that, that was going to be my question, if we had to quit yes. at uh, 8 sharp. So we can we can run over a little bit. Yes. Okay, Okay. good. Uh, good, thank you, Adriano. May, maybe, Miguel, you want to weigh in on this one as well? You, you sometimes feel that you... You don't really know what what you're doing. Ah, uh, yes, of, of course. Every day is a challenge, and and I, I love the challenge. Uh, you have to to manage this state of your your soul and your interior. You sometimes you have um, a lot of nervous uh, states of anxiety, and but um, fortunately, unfortunately. Uh, TV TV show series are too long, so uh, sometimes you can feel in that state because uh, a lot of people the, in, the next day uh, are going to feel in the same state. So you probably you you have the opportunity to help somebody and and you have to create a, a real team that supports all together and. This is basis for for a long project like a series. So sometimes uh, Gaffer say to you, "Hey, let's let's do this this or or the DIT can help you or the you know you you can receive the the help uh, from a lot of people and sometimes you you have to preserve the confidence and 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 through you know, the uh, ir directo, no sé, Carlos. Okay, thank you, Miguel. Uh, I'm looking at the questions here, and there's one question uh, uh, to you, Miguel, here, having to do, I guess, with creating backgrounds uh, using AI. Ah, okay. So that's uh, from uh, Manuel Velasquez, ADFC. Uh, yes. ¿Qué software utilizas para crear estos fondos en AI? Uh, we are using uh, Midjourney. And um, I don't remember. We, Will Blue, I think. And Photo Leaks that I can upscale an image from. Um, 512 pixels to four key pixels. So this is the, the, the point. You can get a large image now, just yes, now, that, this week. So it's happening very fast. And as DOPs, we have to, to control the, the, the system and, and the possibilities because we are the generators, the, the, the human generators of image. So let's try to control the, the AI, you know. It's, it's a challenge too for us. Yes, thank you, Miguel. Uh, there's a question here, which I, I think was pretty good. And uh, it's for uh, Adriana and uh, Miguel, whoever wants to, to answer. Uh, it's from Mariolino, 1971. Um, have you worked with cinematographers turned directors and was it more challenging in terms of they questioning your light or camera moves? Ah. <laughs> I have, I mean, many years back, I used to do commercials with directors that came from still photography. So that's one thing. And also uh, I had a, I have a very good friend that turned the DOP turned into director that I also did a few I mean mainly commercials they uh, it can be very challenging I'd say because they come with a lot of confidence in a sense that they 
sometimes know as much as you do in terms of you know the lenses and cameras they have this uh technical knowledge that the majority of the directors don't have some of them have curiosity about equipment and lenses but not actual knowledge so it comes with that challenge because they you can or challenge or or, or luxury so when when you be able to actually have con technical conversations with your director um but i no, I don't remember being specifically challenging. No, I think it's just a different sort of relationship. Um, but still, on the day, he's the director and, and you're the DOP. So, yeah, it's a different background for them, but it doesn't change much, I'd say, for us now. I would think if, if uh, both people are confident in themselves, they can accept that, okay, this is a new role now and... and uh, I have a different set of uh, obligations here that I have to take care of. And, and why would you then interfere with somebody else's uh, job? I think uh, if, if, if both people are feeling confident with, with themselves and the role they have to play, I, I think there shouldn't be much uh, in terms of rivalry or something like that, or questioning what, what they're doing. Yeah, exactly. Um, Yes. Uh, well, we have some flattering remark here. Thank you for the great conversation. I sure learned a lot. That was nice. That was, wasn't really a question, but uh, we can all uh, take that to our heart. Um, there's a question here about color scheme. Um, there's uh, a viewer here who feels that um, uh, there's an overuse of red, cyan, and green uh, in movies these days. Is, is this something you've, you've reflected on, or sorry, no? I, mm, I I I read the question. I don't. I mean, he's probably he's in his. Who is this? Sorry, uh, Binan. It said. Um, 1930 here. Yeah, uh, what I what I think is, but he's probably thinking of a specific show, or maybe a couple of specific shows he's been watching that come that have those cyan red tones. But I'm not familiar. I mean, I haven't played with those uh, secondary colors much. Right. Sorry, I didn't read the the. Yes. It was 1930 there. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll scroll up here and see what we have. Um, I, I wanted to ask the new color scheme. To... Oh, I, I like that scheme yeah. because I like the complementary colors and to reinforce the chromatic contrast. For me, it's, I, I wore every, all the time about two concepts, con tonal contrast and the chromatic contrast. And it was red and and cyan, no? It's green. So if you want to use, go ahead. Right. There's uh, an Alberto F. Fernandez Valls here. Um, 1859 was the time when it was sent. Uh, and this is in Spanish, but I'll try to do it in English. Um, this question concerns that the DOP is taking on more and more roles that, that aren't really the DOP's roles, like things that really should be the responsibility of, of a producer or, or uh, a production designer or something. And does this mean that it actually puts a great burden on you? you, you Adriano, you, were, you touched upon it saying that you sometimes have to be a psychologist as well, and that's it's not really your job. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I don't want to be, I mean, pretentious about it. I mean, of course, they come with, you know, a lot of background and a lot of inputs as well. They, you, especially if they join a big show like Casa de Papel or The Crown, they prep themselves a lot. So there's always, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, I'm always open for, we should be always open for this collaboration, even when you get directors that, like I said, are coming to do their first episode. They're still kind of trying you know, 
trying to read who is who and, you know, how to deal with the GOP that is so familiar to the show, you know, so you, it's just, I think it's just part of, part of the job anyway. I think that would happen on a prep for a feature film anyway, if you haven't worked with that director before. So you have to create a relationship in order to support a healthy, a healthy real relation on set, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and that is the most the sorry. Yes, no, the, you wanna... this is the, the most important thing to create the relationship, communication all the time, and integrate uh, the, the opinion of the, the rest of the people. And finally we 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 have to work like like a like a um team and sorry Adriano. No, so no, 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 Kevin. Sorry, sorry. I, I actually, I, I saw a question here from Ryan De Franco. Could you speak about the experience of in, getting interviewed for projects, preparation that goes into meetings with new directors? If that's, that's part that's of the question, that's a good if, question. I'd say, for me, Ryan, I usually I usually read the script twice, and 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 uh, uh, in in especially I try to read it the second time on the actual interview day so it's really fresh in your mind read enough about the director you're, if you're meeting the person for the first time and in my case I'm not sure I, this is an advice but in my case I never talk visuals first I never come trying to sell something or showing a reference I my preference is to talk about story and characters First, get to know a little bit more about the director and his taste, what he is thinking first. So, and also, I usually I'm usually very open about the fact that I don't I don't have references. Sorry, guys, I'm un, I'm I prepared enough because I read the script, but I don't come with pre uh, pre uh, arranged, let's say, ideas. Or so I'm I'm usually very open and frank about the the, the fact that I don't. I don't bring references. I mean, it's very rare that I suggest something on the very first chat. That should be on the first one when, or if you get the job, when you have the production designer, the costume designer, the location uh, manager. So it's a, it's a work, it should be always a working process. I think the, the, you shouldn't really try to sell a hard vision uh, on something that is absolutely new to you and it's not so new to whoever is across the screen or across the table, that person, that director or the producers, they have read the script more times than you. So they have discussed it more times than you have. So it's good that you come enthusiastic, but not with preconceived ideas. That's my, that's my approach. I know people that do differently. They really do visual research. They, they, you know, they bring like, a, uh, like some sort of a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation, which is not bad, but I usually don't do that. Miguel, do you have a specific approach to interviews? Sí, yo llevo 10 años trabajando con el mismo showrunner. De ahí se han derivado muchas de las cosas que hemos hablado hoy, ¿no? Como el puesto de visual designer o el puesto de coproductor ejecutivo. Y hace 10 años tuve una entrevista con Alex Pina. Eh, yo concreté la entrevista. No, no fue que él me llamara, yo quise conocerla a él porque lo consideraba el rey Midas de la ficción española. Y él, sé que él tenía un proyecto de película y me ofrecí para hacerla. Eh, no, la, no hablamos nada sobre lo visual. Yo le dije que las series que hacía me parecían terribles a nivel de imagen y que tenía que integrar la cinematografía en su trabajo. Eh, y después bebimos, no sé, un montón de cervezas y acabé con él en su casa a las 4 de la mañana. Entonces, hay muchas formas de llegar a los sitios ¿no? y de, de afrontar una entrevista. Pero lo primero es siempre crear la confianza. Cuando creas la confianza, mmm, ya tus propuestas van solas. Tienen que poder delegar en ti... Eh, Todas esas decisiones, no, a nivel artístico y, y visual. So Miguel says um, 
He's been working for 10 years with the same showrunner, and that is where the visual designer uh, job came about. But he, too, he, he had an interview with Alex Mita uh, 10 years ago, and uh, it was Mega himself who uh, got the interview. Uh, they never talked about anything about the visuals. What uh, Mega said to him was that he thought that the visual aspect, the image of his productions were terrible and that he should integrate cinematography to his filmmaking. Um, they drank uh, beer until 4 a.m. Uh, and it worked well. The, uh, the first thing that Mega thinks that is um, really meaningful is to create a confidence. And then after you have that confidence for the director, the proposals and the offer he has to make will come by itself. I, I think uh, we can start to close this okay. talk. Right. Uh, uh, I want to thank you, our speakers, and all the attendees, um, because uh, it's two hours talking about cinematography. I think it was very, very interesting, uh, but it's a Sunday, all the people, <laughs> morning or lunch or <laughs> afternoon, all the people take the time to, to hear us, to hear you. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, Carlos. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, we will be inviting you to the next Imago Talk um, next month. Uh, so I, I don't know if maybe Mustafa wants to say something to close. Uh, I want to thank everybody for, for being here, uh, Adriano, Miguel, uh, Lars, and Carlos, and obviously you, uh, Adriana. And uh, I think it's important to say that for people who weren't able to uh, attend today's uh, Imago Talks, uh, it will be in the future on the, the website. Uh, so they can, uh, this one and, and the previous one. Uh, but thank you for a successful uh, meeting. Thank you.